guys. So today we are joined by David from Canine Karma Training. David is a former special education teacher and um, behavior therapist. So we're going to go and add Mr. David in. We have a ton of questions, like five pages worth of questions. Try to get through. Come here. Hey. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Not bad. Nice to see you in real time. Yeah, you too. So we have a ton of questions. We actually have um, five pages worth. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So before we get into all of those questions, I wanted to talk to you about your um, personal background and how that's kind of shaped the way that you train dogs and um, your business. Uh, yeah. Um, it's definitely an unexpected, uh, fortunate coincidence to have gone to school for what I did, um, f to have chosen the career path that I originally did, you know, considering later in life, I would unexpectedly veer off to dog training, but, um, yeah, I was a behavior therapist for two to five year olds with special needs. Um, that wasn't like the, like the degree that's not, you know, like the exact thing I went to school for, but that's what I was doing, um, for, I don't know, like eight years or something. And I was doing that and training dogs at the same time, uh, you know, at, at one point, because I was doing that before I started training dogs. Um, but having that understanding, um, that deeper understanding of behavior and behavior modification. It's not something where it's like, Oh yeah, I watched that DVD. Like I, I went to school for like seven years for, for these subjects for, you know, like, like things like operant conditioning. It wasn't like, Oh yeah, I read that definition online. Like I had to take classes and like write papers and like actually really, really study this class after class year after year. So I think having that so deeply ingrained in me and actually like working, you know, as a behavior therapist for years, it's changed the way I work with dogs dramatically. You know, that's like when I first started working with dogs, everything I saw around me was like, I don't agree with this. I don't like the way you guys are treating your dogs. <laughs> like everything I saw, I was like, I don't, that doesn't make sense to me. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. So there were things that I did like every other dog owner that I didn't agree with. Right? Like, you know, you've done things with your dog that you now look back on and you're like, fuck, you know, like, I shouldn't have done that. You know, mm -hmm. I shouldn't have, like, what a stupid thing to do. It was so obvious, but it wasn't because you didn't know it. Mm -hmm. Like, what sorts of things are you talking about? Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's tons. Like, I was, I was explaining to someone uh, today the consequences of, of, you know, rewarding your dog for begging for human food and how how drastically that can change your relationship. And I, I can't like, I'm not going to fall down that rabbit hole on this because it's a very long, like full explanation to fully get it. But um, when I just explained to them, I was like, your dog is li like, they're not begging. Like they don't need it. Your dog's walking over going, I want that. 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 And you sit there and go, okay. And give it to them. Like, how do you think that affects your relationship when you do that? And then you sit there and have the nerve to tell them what to do when the dog can walk over and like, they, they get whatever they want when they want it. And they just sat there and they're like, damn, because they didn't think about that because they do it like crazy. They get, their dog begs bad though. Mm -hmm. Like they, they can't eat without the dog being all over them. And when I explain that, they're like, that's so obvious that that's so conflicting and, and, and contradicting with everything else that we do in our relationship. I do that one thing and then two seconds later yell at them for something and the dog's like confused because that doesn't make any sense, mm -hmm. you know? But we, we constantly do, think of the way you talk about your dog, the way anyone talks about their dog. We contradict the relationship we're talking about in every sentence. We call them man's best friend, but we say they should do everything we say. Mm -hmm. I don't tell my friends what to do, right? right. Like there are baby, there are kids, this, you know, the, like this, but, but they should do like do everything you say, you're the master, they're this, like that. These are all completely contradicting things. And when yes. you treat the dog that way, it leads to a very confused dog and a very out of shape relationship. Mm -hmm. I, I really like that you um, brought that up. 
Um, I want to talk about the name of your business, Canine Karma Training. Mm -hmm. Why is it called this? So the real, it's every time people ask me this, it's very difficult. So like a lot of times I'm, I'm guilty of not giving a, a, a truly accurate answer. And I'll just be like, oh, well, my dog's name Karma. But that's not the real explanation. So the real explanation would literally require like, almost like, like, like most of an evaluation for a dog because I have to start explaining like, like a lot of different concepts because everything in my system comes back around. Everything ties into itself. Everything comes back around. Like the way that I use eye contact, it's, you're not just distracting the dog. You should be using eye contact in a way that, that changes the, the relationship. Like you could use eye contact just to get like a, you know, a focused heel or a front or get a good picture for Facebook, or you could use eye contact to build absolute neutrality in situations where your dog used to be aggressive, fearful, terrified. They wanted to, you know, either run away or hide or bite the decoy in a, in a in, you know, in, in a protection sport, or you can use eye contact to change your entire relationship, to take a dog that goes from wanting to murder people who come in the house to now looking at you like, well, this is your, your house. You're the one running the show. There's a person here and they just look up at you and like everything kind of comes back and ties back together. And that's what karma is. So my original logo, there's the karma knot. It's the infinity knot behind the logo. So that knot, like every line just keeps going back around into itself. If you take a good look, it's not, this is a newer logo, so I'm not wearing it right now, but that's all intentional because everything I do, it all kind of cycles back in. And I know there's clients watching this that are going like, yeah, you really can't explain because they, 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 they've sat there and after like an hour and 20 minutes of like the first time we sat down and did an eval or a consult, I'm like, see how it all comes back in together. And it, it, it makes sense, but it requires such a long, ridiculous, you know, like to truly understand it. It's a very long explanation, but it's, it is because everything kind of comes back to that same foundation the same relationship the same you know like core beliefs and, and and practices and tactics and like eye contact is the first thing i teach every dog for a reason and it has been for like seven years mm -hmm. right and everything i do eventually it's like well you need eye contact to fix that mm -hmm. but it's not the, like just distract the dog that's not what i mean so sometimes people hear that explain and they're like oh i'll just teach my dog a ton of eye contact mm -hmm. Well, first of all, how, what are you doing? Are you holding food up? Are you free shaping? Are you doing it with distractions, pressure? Are you using frustration? Cause I use frustration. Like there's a lot of ways to teach it. And then after you teach it, how are you using it? When, how are you rewarding? What's your reward system? Like there's so much to it, you mm -hmm. know, and you can go on and on forever. That's why when I do lessons with people, the first lesson is that entire reward system, marker training, eye contact focus, because you're going to need it for everything else later on, mm -hmm. because it's all gonna come back to that. You know, yeah. so that's like another random example, because I wasn't planning that, but that's another example. It's all gonna come back to that one. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a lot of examples in my training where it's like, yeah, it all comes back to this. So it's mm -hmm. harmony. Love it. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so, how sorry, you... I, I know it sounds like a rambling lunatic, but that's why like, my, I know my clients are listening to that going like, yeah, you can't really fully explain it. No, David, mm. I get it. I mean, it's yeah. like, because I feel like it's all psychological, like everything yeah. that we train our dogs and uh, like the bad behavior, it comes back to the owner. And um, I think a lot of dog owners, you know, you have that aha click moment where you're like, yeah. this, this is on me. Like I have, yeah. I'm the reason why this, this, and this is happening. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes you like need that wake up call, like maybe for, like from a trainer or uh, yeah, real, from a trainer or someone else to be like, you know, that's unacceptable or like, yeah. that's just not how a dog should act. And yeah. it's on you, whether you want to like l open your eyes and see that that's a problem or just let it be. Yeah. So. I think it's easier to get the wake up call than to give the wake up call. Okay. So someone who has to give the wake up call every single day. Like I've spent all day. This is like, I've spent eight hours straight talking just like, cause that's what doing lessons is today, especially online. I spent eight hours. Like I spent my last lesson ended 20 minutes before this. Like that's what I do all day is let you know, like, and it, it, it's, it sucks to be the person to give the wake up call, 
But then at the same time, you know that that wake up call just changed everything. Right. Yeah. And and a lot of the times people are paying for that wake up call. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Like they they need it. And they want it and you know, it's yeah. Okay, how do you give the wake up call? <laughs> uh gently, I'm very honest and I'm very straightforward, but there's a difference between being straightforward and rude. Um and I think something that anyone who's literally ever even had like whether it's in person or on the phone like an eval a console that first you know like one i tell i am brutally honest about my own dogs and my own experiences like i tell people things that i've gone through and done or said like with with dogs or dog training tools my previous beliefs on this or that that are embarrassing like my reaction the first time i saw a prong collar in pet smart like nine years ago or ten i think ten years ago now and i like flipped out because i thought it was like used to murder animals and looks like a torture device and the girl <laughs> legitimately started choking because she couldn't stop laughing at me so i almost killed someone with my stupidity uh, but i tell people like i've made every mistake in the book besides like hurting a dog like i don't do anything stupid or you know but like that's how we get here we all make stupid mistakes we all make you know, very common mistakes, but like I've made every mistake and I like, I'll tell people like they're talking to me and their dog's six months old. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, look, if you take anything we talk about personally, there's a problem because I messed these things up worse than you did right now. I did this worse with my first dog and people are like, Oh, Oh, you're human. So this isn't like something to take, you know, offense because that, that, I think that's a huge topic on Instagram right now is is like dog trainers talking down to their clients, dog trainers like belittling their like, oh, you didn't know that this is going to mess up your dog. Like, oh, you're an idiot. You shouldn't have got that dog. What are you doing doing this? How could you do? And like, you got to be an idiot to think that's going to like you're going to be successful if that's the way you talk to people. Like, aside from, like, a decade in sales and stuff, like, I was a teacher. Mm -hmm. I had to break down extraordinarily complicated things to extraordinarily simple minds. And, you know, like, it, when you have to take something incredibly complex and break it down so literally anyone can learn it, you got to do it gently. Mm -hmm. And, when, like, my field was special education. So if I can sit down with mom and dad, and talk to them about little Timmy's like behavioral problems and possibly even like diagnoses, disorders, like, like legitimate things. Um, talking to someone about their dog is a walk in the park. What's mm -hmm. horrifying is that in my experience, people are actually m more defensive about their dogs than their kids. And I'm not, I'm saying that for like, for real, like, not, like people are more protective and defensive over their dogs. They get more reactive over like, you could insult someone's daughter and they take it better than like insulting their dog. But I had a, I had so many years of talking to parents about their kids. Like part of my job was literally titled parent training, which is demeaning. The name of it's demeaning. And I, I, I thought like, I want, like, I wanted them to call it parent counseling because everybody would sign up. But part of my job was literally to go into someone's home. I don't have kids. They're looking at me like I had a shaved face. I look like I'm 14 years old. And they're like, look at this idiot telling me how to be a parent. That's literally what part of my job was, was explaining to them, here's the issue in your relationship. Mm -hmm. Here's why Ashley is a terror at home. But at school, she's great. Or why she's, you know, like she's not bad at home. She's a nightmare at school. But when I walk in the in the room, you know, three, four days a week to work with her for an hour, she's, she's awesome. I just have a better working relationship with her. Here's how you fix it. Here's how you get it. Here's what you do. Here's what you, you know, you're doing this and this and this. That's contradicting the relationship. That was my job. So being able to explain that to someone about humans, about children, explaining it to you about what, like why your dog is an asshole is easy. You just don't say it like that. Right. And I think that's a massive problem right now is like nobody knows how to talk to people because of social media or because they've never had any other job experience. They've only trained dogs. So they've never talked to people. So now when they when they do a real lesson with someone, the, the client's like, did I like anger you? Are you offended? Why are you talking to me like that? You know, like, mm -hmm. like people love their dogs. Think of how much we invest in our dogs. Nobody wants to be talked down to about what they what they did wrong. 
Right? Right. Like, especially when you know you've done it, you know that trainer talking down to you has done the same stupid mistakes at some point mm -hmm. or worse. Yeah, I mean, I think that with social media, there's like, there's two parts. It's like, what is your goal? Are you working on your social media engagement? Or are you genuinely trying to connect people, connect with people and help them with their dogs? Mm -hmm. And like most trainers, you're not going to get, um, you're only going to get so much so far on Instagram. There's only so much you can learn in, you know, a three minute clip, five minute clip, you know, yeah. so um, definitely something to consider. But I'm glad you brought up the attitude part because um, recently I had someone um, reach out to me and say, you know, I connected with so and so. And I was thinking that they were going to, you know, think that I was so like stupid or think I was dumb for thinking that. And that made me really, really sad. Because I've, I have found that so many of the trainers that I've connected with have been so open and have mm -hmm. been so um, just ha have been really great to connect with because they share their struggles mm -hmm. and because they're honest about being be, once being a beginner. So thank you for bring, bringing that up because yeah. it's definitely. Um, yeah, it sucks. Like I, I've had countless people tell me like, oh, it took me so long to reach out because, you know, like I was intimidated. Why? Well, it wasn't you. I actually didn't know you. It was because my last trainer, mm -hmm. like it's because of bad experiences. And if you have enough, what we're products of conditioning, just like our dogs, when you have rep after rep after rep of like terrible experience with something, you avoid it. So now those humans, those handlers show avoidance behavior, approaching, you know, dog trainers for help just like right like it's all the same thing mm -hmm. so like it, it, it's it's sad and like I've, I've heard it forever i've heard it my entire career and it's like how you said you know you can only you go so far on instagram like i wish people really understood that because that that statement can be said in a lot of ways as dog trainers you can only go so far on instagram and like if, if it disappeared today where would most people's businesses be right now and like, that's something that should be taken serious, you know, like you got to be trained to the dogs around you, not just dogs online. Um, because you can only go so far with this, this won't be around forever. Mm -hmm. Right? Like it's, they're all fads, you know, like if this is going to be something just like MySpace eventually. Right. Right. It's, so then where is everyone like going? Anything else. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, so bringing up experiences, positive, negative, um, I want to talk about your manicures and your nails and uh, basically like how the heck do you do it? <laughs> so first of all, I'm not like a groomer or some crazy specialist. Um, it's not like that. I am. Um, I started doing my dog. I bought a $66 fold up grooming table. That's still in the other room right over there that I still use to this day. I just used it yesterday. Um, and a Dremel because the way my dog's nails were being done and the way she was being handled by the unfortunately inexperienced employees of the large business that I was taking my dog to get their nails done at were conditioning her to have pretty horrible reactions to having her nails done. So this dog that is like obsessively in love with every human being on the planet was developing some terrible uh, behaviors and feelings about having her nails done. So, you know, to avoid them like creating like a serious problem or even a bite in my dog because of what they were doing with her, I bought a grooming table and a Dremel and I was like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So I'm just going to figure it out. Um, I did go to a grooming place like eight years ago and I actually paid the guy like $150 if I could just kind of like hang out for an hour, like kind of like watch what people were doing. Um, so smart. I did that. Yeah. Like and then the guy thought it was a whack job, but he's like, like, I, I think it was also because I offered him like what he, I didn't realize 150 was like a ridiculous amount. I, I could have given him 20 bucks mm -hmm. and he told me that when I left, <laughs> like I could have given him $20. Yeah. He would have let me hang out. But I gave like 150 bucks to like, like see what these people, how they're going, you know, it's really not that hard. But like my focus on it isn't like, I'm not like some hardcore, like my dog's nails are perfect. Like Karma, for example, has naturally super long uh, quicks in her nails. So her nails are always longer than I would like. Mm -hmm. The other two dogs are fine though. And I do her nails, but I'm not like hardcore religious about it. 
but it'll it, it rather than you taking something and putting it in the hands of someone else this is something you are responsible for and you could do yourself and should be able to do yourself like you should be able to do your dog's nails and if you can't if your dog is like oh yeah we can cuddle on the couch for hours but if you touch my foot i will fuck you up there's a problem like that's a relationship problem there's a lack of trust there if like you can't handle the, your, your dog in ways like that like and i know people are probably pissed right now like people get mad when i talk about this stuff but like i'm sorry it's true like my dog used to show her teeth to me i'm not being a dick like i'm I'm saying it from because I've done this with hundreds of dogs besides my own. Like my dog used to show her teeth to me. And if, if you get like a little close, too close to a vein without looking at you, she'll like her lip will curl back. Cause it's like those old instincts. And she'll be like looking over there and like, you'll see her lip curl. Back. I don't even say that. Like, Cause it's just like, she's not doing anything. She would never bite me, hurt me. Like, but I was taking something that's a serious bond and relationship building activity and paying someone $15 or $20 to do it for me. And they were butchering the like, like, you know, behaviors in the process, teaching my dog that this is a horrible, miserable thing that you should defend yourself from. They're going to hurt you because they did over and over and over again, you know, like, but like, why would you give that opportunity to someone else when you could use that as like a bonding and trust building exercise? Like if you can't do your dog's nails, fix the problem that's a problem mm -hmm. you so, know what i mean like yes definitely the thing is though with with um like grooming or with nails nail clipping you don't see a lot of people clipping their dog's nails i think you're the only no. one on instagram i see you know doing doing your dog's nails oh so, that's like, horrifying if that's true but like I, there's a few uh, <laughs> So like, I, I know people do it, but um, I guess, yeah, it probably isn't talked about enough. Like, I personally don't like clipping. Like, it scares me. I don't want to, like, clip too close. Because even if you clip really close to the quick, but you don't get it, the clipping splinters the nails, and it's compressing the nails. So that vein is in there, and you're compressing the nail around it. It hurts. Mm -hmm. And it hurts a lot more than the vibration of a high-quality Dremel. Like when people buy like $30 pieces of like generic garbage off Amazon and that's their Dremel, like it's going to be rough, you know, like it matter, like mechanics matter. The smoother that, you know, rotation, the smoother it's going to be for the dog, like the less, you know, like traumatic like experience, you know, if, if, if you want to put it that way. Mm -hmm. That's why like I, you know, I use a hundred dollar Dremel and some people are like, Oh, that's too much. Mm -hmm. It's so much better. It's quieter. It's faster. It's easier. It's, so I, I want to go back to that, um, mm -hmm. the, that $150 that you spent with that one groomer shadowing him has given you a, a lifetime of trimming your dog's nails at home. If I wasn't on the phone, I would do the math. I did the math for someone recently. It was like a couple weeks ago. I have saved like $7,000, 7, something dollars in grooming by just doing it myself. Like, that's a minimum. I've saved at least, it was like $7,600 in grooming. I believe that. Like, yeah. that's, that's absolutely, well, actually, that was math for one dog. So that was math, that's how much I've saved for Karma, was $7,600 in grooming for her. What about the other two oh, dogs? Yeah. Right? So, like, it's, 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 it's got to be like $12,000, like, yeah. something absolutely ridiculous. And that's another reason. Mm -hmm. You can spend a hundred dollars and save ten thousand over your dog's life. Like that's mm -hmm. ridiculous. You know, like how could you not do that? Right. So, okay, I want to rephrase this. What are the benefits of trimming your dog's own nails? Why should um, I invest in a Dremel for my dog? I, I well, the, I, so I don't want. First of all, like just disclaimer because it's twenty twenty one. I don't want a bunch of people going out with a Dremel and like filing the dog's nails down. There's blood all over the fucking oh, walls. And they're like, he told me to do it. Like, I didn't say anything. I didn't tell you how to do it. I'm just saying, learn how to do it. Pay some, you know, like learn how to do it. But it's a, you can, it's, if you do it properly, like if you do it the way I would do it, like using like, like reward system and everything, like, it's a bond building exercise. It's a trust building exercise, but there's also a lot of ways to do that. So I taught a client a couple of months ago, putting their, I don't know if you've seen what I'm talking about, but putting their dog up on cans, 
like coffee cans, like balancing up on coffee cans. They did a bunch of trust building exercises like that. And the dog won't let them do their nails. So with the dog up on cans, I told her to get the Dremel and do the dog's nails. So she did like an entire paw and the dog just stood on the cans, let her do an entire paw. And I'm like, awesome, put them away. That was made, like get them some water, like take them down, reward them, put them away, do the rest another time. Like, I mean, because, but there's way, there's reasons for that. Yeah. So when you understand how that behavior works, like when understanding stress, there's not just stress, there's distress, the negative, and there's eustress, which is positive, right? And stress can, can have like truly beneficial things, but, and I got it from that man right there who just commented with a little emoji from Jensen, because he's <laughs> like, like, like that's, a, that's a phenomenal trainer that you should talk to. Um, but channeling that, like I already understood a lot of that and do a lot of that in training, but then you, like talking to someone like him where he has that down to like a science, you can do things like that. Like it was never about putting the dog in the coffee can. So if a bunch of people like just run out and buy cans and like put their dogs on cans, they're, it's not going to do anything for you. You got to understand why and how, and like there's a whole process like you're going to see all these pictures of dogs on cans for no reason but wait david i want to just stop you because mm -hmm. i have a little bit more faith in the people that are watching and the people that are people like me who oh of course. pay for you know that um really respect our trainers and um pay for training sessions and want to learn you know like this is yes you you can have you know joe schmo that's like oh cans you know and and does all that but like really like talk to me you know like i literally oh, just course. got a dremel you know and like right. i actually like right. how should i introduce and like like this yeah is absolutely like well i say that because like the can specifically that is a thing that people see it so they just do it mm -hmm. and it's done all it's a very big thing like people just do it but it could be a super productive exercise Mm -hmm. just like doing your dog's nails it could be traumatic and you're just grabbing and forcing it to happen yeah. or it could be a really productive bonding exercise right mm -hmm. so people will do things where they just distract the dog they put like peanut butter on the wall and the dog's licking it and they're you know like doing their nails and technically like you could get some benefits out of doing ridiculous stuff like that like you could technically desensitize the dog to having their nails done a little bit mm -hmm. i would go way more in depth with it I would work more on doing um, like teaching the dog to accept restraint or accepted restraint where you, where you teach the dog to allow you to physically manipulate their body, like allowing you to open their mouth, like, like go inside their ears, touch their paws. So I would first teach accepted restraint and I would teach that and reward them for doing things like first just picking up their paw. And, and rewarding that, like playing with their paw pads, their nails, their individual toes. And like, as they're allowing me to do this and relaxing into it and allowing me to move and manipulate, I'm rewarding them and moving right along. Um, so that later on, I can now do an entire nail, good, reward them. Do a nail, good, reward them. Later on, it's a paw, reward them. Like when I did Karma's nails yesterday, I did three of her paws and then I was like, oh damn, I didn't reward her yet. Cause she was so good. I was I forgot like I was just cruising because she's she's so good. She doesn't need the reward anymore. Mm -hmm. She doesn't need like me to sit there and like just reward her like crazy. You know, and like I I also did stuff with her. Like I used to take her to the vet and have the vet do her nails. But I and I could do her nails. But she one, she would let them, she was fine. But I would do eye contact exercises with her. And I would have her stare at me and I would reward her for holding focus while the vet did her nails the whole time. Mm. And she would do it. And she'd just sit there and like take food the whole time. And so it turned into another productive way to desensitize the dog. But there's a lot of ways to introduce it. Like if the dog's afraid of the Dremel, now you got to baby step your way into that. Get mm. them used to just like being around a Dremel that's not on. Then you turn <laughs> it on, you start over. Then you turn, touch it to the, you know, like... You just baby step your way through all these things. Doesn't mean it has to take forever. It just means little steps are the way to, mm -hmm. to go. Like, I'm not the guy who's like, just hold their paw. Like, don't. That's mm -hmm. not the way to do it. Mm -hmm. Makes yeah. sense. Okay. But I don't do the peanut butter on the wall thing. I've never actually done that in my life. Like, I'd rather build trust in a, in a different mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. like, that's not my thing. But it does. That 
I can actually see some benefits coming out of that approach. Mm -hmm. So it's not the worst well, thing I in the world. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing, like when you're giving your dog a bath, like, okay, do you mm -hmm. um, give your dogs a bath or a shower? How do you clean them? Um, so I would do it in the, sh in the shower um, and use like, I have like an extendable nozzle so I can, you know, like bathe them the whole time. Um, I don't like fill the tub up or anything. That'd be gross. <laughs> but I use like the, the, you know, like the nozzle. Um, but my dogs all just sit or stand there the entire time. Like they don't try to go anywhere or get out. Like the only dog that was ever a problem was when she was younger, Karma would, uh, she would stand there for um, a bath, like perfectly fine and be bathing her and like 15 minutes goes in, you know, everything's perfect. And out of nowhere, she'd just be like, I'm out of here. And she'd go right through the curtain out of nowhere. And she would do it every time. I've never had that issue with Manic or Zero. They just, they literally just sit or stand there the entire time they bathe them. Mm -hmm. Like they're effortless. So it makes it mm -hmm. really easy. That's good. Yeah. I mean, everyone showers and baths all different. I see. Yeah. So yeah. Commenting. Okay. Um, also, what do you recommend? How often do you recommend people um, bathe or wash their dogs? Um, honestly, it's, it's not the answer people want because a lot of people want like a scheduled, you know, like every three weeks. I would never do it more than every two weeks unless you absolutely had to, but I only bathe my dogs as needed. That's it. Like, if, if they don't need it, they don't need it. Like, Karma never needs a bath. She's, like, suspiciously, weirdly clean all the time. It's unexplainable. But Zero needs a bath way more often than Manic, right? So I'm not going to sit there and be like, well, I got to do it every three weeks, whether they need it or not. Like, Zero is going to get a bath probably twice as more than, you know, as often as Manic. He's going to get one a thousand times more often than Karma ever will. Like I just do it as they're needed. Like you, sh if you can, if your dog, if your hands smell petting your dog, that's gross. Bathe your dog. You know what I mean? Like when you go to someone's house and touch their dog, and like you're like, oh shit, you don't want to be that person. Yeah. But that's not healthy for them. It's mm -hmm. not about the like the gross factor, the embarrassment. It's just not healthy. Like imagine touching your hair and it was that gross. Like if if you can smell it, if you can feel it in their coat, like it should really be based on that. Mm -hmm. not like a scheduled maintenance thing like right because i know a lot of people like i'm a scheduled kind of person so I, I know what it's like when you're when you need things to be regimented and someone's like no you just do it as you need to but like you just yeah. do it as you need to if it was right. like you're brushing your teeth you should do it every day you right. know like that's different yeah but, it makes sense if you have greasy hair you know when it's time <laughs> right like your hair's disgusting <laughs> take a you know take a shower <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah um, nice okay. Time. So since you um, brought up your dogs, can you talk about your dogs? Um, each one, what is you? What is your favorite thing about each? Um. Uh, I mean, karma is like the reason for everything. So, like, obviously, my attachment to her is going to be deeper and longer. She's also more than twice their age. Um, but she's just. I don't know. She's like, she, she's not the perfect dog, but she is a really good dog today, even though she used to be the spawn of Satan, but she's just a sassy, like, she's like a tiny little human. And I don't humanize my dog, but like even dog trainers have met her and be like, is she really doing that? Like, because she just does ridiculous stuff. Like she just has a lot of personality and it's not human clearly, but she just has a lot of personality for a dog. Um, Zero is my, my special child. Zero, Zero has like a clinically diagnosable, like permanent joy disorder. Like the dog is always on cloud nine. Like he, he comes out of his crate like every day. Every, like it could be four in the morning and he's like, time to party. I'm here. <laughs> it's good to be alive today. I just want to thank everyone. Like, he, he's just high on life all the time. So, like, you can't not look at this idiot running around like the happiest animal on the planet and not feel some of that. So, like, if I was ever upset and needed that, like, instant smile, I'm opening his crate. Mm -hmm. like, like, he's the dog. Like, he, it's just, you can't stop that much positivity. 
it's it's overwhelming. Like if he was a human, you wouldn't even want to be friends with him. It'd be too much. <laughs> like too much happiness. It'd be like Kimmy Schmidt on Netflix if you've ever seen that. <laughs> Um, yeah, that would be zero. Like he's he thinks every living animal is his friend. Like birds, squirrels, horses are just giant puppies to him. Like he's he's just high on life. Um, Manic. I don't know if I have a favorite thing about Manic. Like he, I don't want to say because it'd be very misleading to be like he's the easiest dog I've ever had because he's not like he was he was really challenging he's he's not a naturally engaging dog and everything I do is, was based heavily on engagement but he wouldn't engage you know he wasn't easy like the dog has like an out of control amount of drive and a tiny squeaky little body but his intelligence is unlike anything I've ever worked with in my life like it's it's it, like truly unlike anything I've ever really experienced, but that's also what made me want them because I got to work with not I didn't train them, but I got to work with both of the parents, and they understood both of the parents so well, especially Puma. Um, but the dog's intelligence is just out of this world. It's also my living nightmare <laughs> and the biggest challenge in training because he is so freakishly painfully intelligent. So he'll anticipate things that have never happened that he shouldn't be able to have known. Like he'll do things and I'm like, we've never done this. I just said it out loud to you. Why did he know what was gonna happen? And, and like, he does things where it drives me crazy. But at the same time, his brain is why I'm able to do all the crazy stuff I, I'm able to do with him, you mm -hmm. know? But he's just this bomb proof, crazy little dog. So I-, I Question, know. what came first? D did you, um, well, how did you get into PSA and did you get manic um, for PSA? So I, I got into it. I contacted Jonathan um, because I was interested in doing bite work and getting into it, but I was looking to do IPO or IGP or shuts in or whatever. Um, that's what I was looking to do. Uh, and he converted me. Um, it didn't like take much. I, I like saw like one session of, you know, a dog, in a, you know, with, with a bite suit. And I was like, all right, I'm sold. Let's do this. But I also, like, I didn't understand anything about any of these sports. It, it wasn't like I had a lot of years of education about it. It's not like I really knew the inner workings of Shooksen. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't know what the hell I was looking at. Like, I didn't know what I was looking at with PSA. But at the time I looked at, I was like, this is amazing. And I still think that right now, that's why I still do it. Because to me, for me personally, absolutely my most stimulating and fulfilling sport, right? Like, if, like I get the most out of that than I would out of anything else for myself personally. I love it. But I also love it because it's functional. Like I don't teach my dog anything in PSA that's not functional in one way or another. And I love that. Like, I love that I can use my training. I'm not saying that just because you do PSA, your dog is like this, like, unstoppable, you know, stoppable protection dog or anything like that. I'm just saying, like, it's still functional training. You're not dumping thousands of hours into something you can't really use anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And I know that's fine, right? Like, to each their own, their own. But for me, I'm neurotic about things being productive and, like, logical and useful and you know like multi abilities and multitasking like it's, it's my own problem right so like i don't want to train something i can't use somewhere else mm -hmm. so like for me it's the perfect sport you mm -hmm. know like i also don't have to do tracking which mm -hmm. i don't personally have the patience for mm -hmm. you know like that's why i have so much for res you know respect for people who get like an ipo3 because like i can't do ten thousand hours of tracking like, I don't, I personally can't, I don't have that in me. I couldn't do it. Like, you do, so good for you. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I also don't, I can't put that much work into, like, the precision. I'm not that person, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not, it's a level of perfection, like, I'll never train for. <laughs> it's, it's like, just being honest. Like, I don't, mm -hmm. it's not my thing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I just, I, like, I love how much action there is in PSA. I love the way it's set up. It's based on police scenarios, like. I love it. But yeah, Manic was from PSA and for PSA, mm -hmm. you know, so like he could have done anything, but like, like I did definitely get him intending on doing PSA. Mm -hmm. But to be clear, 
I don't ever like I say like I got him to do PSA. I got him and I do PSA. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yes. he's not my PSA dog. He's my dog I do PSA with. And there is a big difference because there's people that that train their dogs and it's just for that sport and that's fine. And that's that's what the dog lives for. But like I, I train my dogs for life. Meaning I don't mean like I'm gonna train them for the rest of their life. I mean I train them for anything I want to do in my life with them. You want to go on a road trip? Let's bring the dogs. Mm -hmm. You know, like not, it's not just about the five minutes on the trial field. It's about everything else you do the rest of the year with your dogs. Um, mm -hmm. But again, to each their own, you know, but like to me, I do need the companion piece too. Mm -hmm. You know, like that is important to me. Right. How has the training with um, Manic been different? Um, or like, how is the lifestyle and like training at home, uh, how is it different for a manic than it is with the other two or is it it's not um well the only dog who is their life at home is very different is karma because she's almost 10 years old she doesn't do anything wrong she doesn't like i'm not like training things and a dog who's almost a decade old like she just kind of does whatever she wants she lays around and like she's just a dog mm -hmm. right she's she's earned her retirement mm -hmm. so her life is different but Manic, Zero, Nina, like they all, they all live the, the same life. Not literally, because they, they, they do very different things, but, they, but at the same time, they don't. They still have the same structure, not schedule, but the same structure, the same rules, the same boundaries, a lot of the same training. Mm -hmm. um, so none of their lives are really different than mm -hmm. each other's. They're, they are, but they're not. You know what I mean? Because, like, yeah. the dogs themselves are so different. Mm -hmm. All of the dogs in this house are so wildly – it's almost like every one of them is opposite from every other one. But at the same time, like, what we – like, how we live isn't mm -hmm. changing depending on, like, that dog. Mm -hmm. You know, like, they, they adapt to, to you. Mm -hmm. And um, how is uh, affection used at home? Do you, like, give it freely or are you more um... – like do you kind of restrict yourself from um so i'm i'm very affectionate with my dogs uh especially according to some people's you know spectrum um but i don't treat my dog like a greek god that i worship i'm not like i'm not the, the days of like laying there and petting them for like six hours while i watch a movie marathon like that honestly doesn't happen um at all ever anymore like i don't i genuinely don't do that um and everyone has their dog for their own reasons if that's what you want to do then that's what you want to do um but i don't do that like i'll still like like karma gets a lot because she's always out and you know there's nothing more appealing than when your dog is minding their damn business and sleeping and you just can't you can't function now you can't you got to go bother them right because they look like an angel when they're asleep so you got to get up and walk over and like touch them and kiss their face and be all over you know like like i get it like i'm still a human like my dog used to sleep in my bed and i did all these things like my old childhood i had dogs in my bed that were bigger than me literally way bigger than me but i don't do that anymore so like she might still be laying on the floor and i'll like lay down with her for a few minutes but I'm 6'3". I'm not trying to have a slumber party on the hardwood floor with my dog for three hours. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not doing that. So I don't do that stuff anymore. But, like, you could not ever see me with my dogs and go, he's not affectionate. Because I'm constantly, like, I like manic. My touch is, like, heroin to him. Mm -hmm. So, like, when he has a toy, I can, I can literally just touch his face. And he'll just sit there and hold the toy forever. Cause he's like, Oh my God, he's touching me. Like I can reward him with touch. It's actually a very important thing for him. I can also calm him down with my touch. So like, it's not like I'm not affectionate. I just don't, I don't go to the extreme anymore. It's not, it's, it's just so counterproductive or contradicting to like so many other things that, that we then ask our dogs, you know, like, so it just doesn't make any sense for me anymore. Mm -hmm. You know? But I also don't need four ridiculous dogs in my bed on my furniture. It's ridiculous. I don't mean that. It's disgusting, you know. So like, I, there's. I also just don't want them up there anyway. 
but they still mm -hmm. all get plenty of affection. Like you can't be around Zero and not give him affection because he's not going to let you. Mm -hmm. He's obsessed with everybody. Like he's going to be your friend whether you like him or not. Mm -hmm. You know, so you can't like. Of course, they get. You know, they're always going to get plenty of affection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um. Okay. Thoughts on um, n nutrition, raw food versus kibble. Um. So to me, because I've been feeding raw and I've been studying dog nutrition like a lunatic for like seven years, to me there there isn't a debate. Like it's just science. Like it's 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 actually like super simple to me at this point. Um, and I get it. Like I, re I I I was super against raw in the beginning. I remember like oh my god, you would you just like you just throw like chicken on your floor and like your dog eats it like. And now, like, clients say that to me, you know, and I sit there and I'm like, no, that's not what we do. Like, you know, like, I understand the apprehension until someone reminds you that your adorable little fluffy bear is a flesh eating, predatory carnivore, biologically engineered to slaughter and eat still bleeding flesh. So, yeah, they're not supposed to eat man made, like, hyper processed, disgusting factory food doesn't even make any sense. So like we, um, we have a boarding train that just got a brand new bag of Merrick and it was filled with worms. Like how are, how are people still giving this to their dogs? And I, like, I, I don't mean that literally, like I get it. I fed kibble too. Like sometimes you just can't feed raw. Sometimes it's just not feasible where you are, what's going on, what you're doing. But, for people who stay away from raw because they look at it and go, I can't afford it, do the math before you write that off and walk away. Because if you have a small dog and you think you can't afford raw, you've never done the math. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people, I've done the math for clients, is even with kibble, going from kibble to kibble, like most people could save a lot of money by actually improving their food. So I see people who feel like blue wilderness which is just hot garbage and they're spending like $78 a bag and they upgrade to nature's logic. And it's like $64 a bag, but that higher quality food also has higher calories, which now requires less cups of food to get your same caloric intake for the day. So your dog isn't as lethargic and bloated from overeating. To, you know. mm -hmm. Like if you wanted, you know, a thousand calories with eins or a thousand calories with origin or nature's logic, there's a drastic difference in how much food it's going to take. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But like, if you have a, if you have like a 15 pound dog, if you own an iPhone, you can afford to feed that dog raw because it's, it's, it's a joke how cheap it is. Mm -hmm. Like feeding four, like our four dogs, that's not, that's not like some super cheap thing. But even then there's, you could get clever. You know, like, like there's a duck farm on Long Island that like we go to and we get, you know, massive amounts of stuff and save a ridiculous amount of money. You're not going to find that in the grocery store, mm -hmm. you know, but like if you do the math first, you might save money feeding raw. Mm -hmm. But if you're not going to feed raw, it doesn't mean all kibble is the same. Right. So like, it, like people ask me like a million times so far, my answer is still nature's logic nature's logic nature's logic because people are going to ask you after this video they're going to ask me nature's logic um, wait is nature's logic um like patties like prepared raw no no for, that's kibble so if you're if you're going to feed kibble that's the only brand i can recommend at this point if you're going to feed Got raw it. that's different okay. so if you're going to feed raw to me you gotta do it right an so unbalanced raw diet is worse than a bad kibble, literally. So like, if it's not balanced, it's 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 gonna be damaging. Mm -hmm. So if, you go, if you're going to feed your dog a raw diet, to me, you should do it the right way. It'll also take like five years of research out of the picture and just go get a customized raw meal plan. That doesn't mean like go anywhere, like research her, who you're going to. Like we use meal plans um, made by Aaron at Raw Pets Rule, uh, like Raw Pets Rule on Instagram. Um, we use meal plans formulated by her because she's amazing, but it takes all of the guesswork out of it. Mm -hmm. All the like trying to figure out ratios and like calcium to phosphorus ratios and how much bone content is in a duck neck. 
Yeah. You know how long it takes to research? Like I have piles of notes over there actually from like six, seven years ago when I was doing all that research for the first time. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. it's, and it's hard, you know, because you go online and everyone says something else. Mm -hmm. Everyone says something different. Like about kibble, everyone says something different. Mm -hmm. You know, so you'll see, um, you'll like, I say nature's logic and you'll see someone else go, oh no, that's not, you should feed this. In my, in my experience, nature's logic is not, it's, it's not, not to be gross, but like when a dog switches to raw, the amount of feces that they now have is reduced dramatically, right? So that does not happen on kibble, but nature's logic, it's kind of like in between because it is reduced. Like, uh, like I've switched countless Gordon trains from whatever garbage they were eating, like science, diet, Purina, to, to nature's logic and the amount goes down notably. And as like the, the rate at which that now decomposes outside, it like goes up dramatically because the dog is actually retaining more of the nutrients. You know, there's a reason why a dog will eat, you know, Purina one and they go to the bathroom and it looks like an elephant shit in your backyard. That, like you can see it from space, but your raw fed dog eats a mountain of body parts and when they go to the bathroom so little comes out it kind of feels like a waste of a bag to pick it up but i gotta do it anyway you know <laughs> like because it's so small because your their body's actually retaining the nutrients so like that so we've alone, been feeding yeah so rika has e eaten raw like since she came home and the one thing i i, I will say is like she was so skinny you know like for, yeah. I, it wasn't until like her heat that like she's been like actually like packing on pounds and like becoming stronger you know so she's obviously scary. developing yeah but it's like i i mean i took a little offense to it like after you know if someone would say like oh my god your dog's so skinny but yeah. it's like the raw I, I agree with you i do think it's the better option for your dog but yeah, it's it's crazy it's the only like if you spend hours after this trying to you know, research, you're never going to find any other area of the world where professionals, medical professionals that went to school for this will tell you that this animal would thrive on processed man-made food. Only, we only hear this with our dogs and cats. Like cats, it's even worse. I would never feed a cat uh, dry food, ever. If I owned a cat, which I don't anymore, but if I owned a cat, it would eat raw. And if I couldn't feed it raw, it would eat wet food. Mm -hmm. Cats should never eat dry food. It is horrible for them. Like the damage it does to their kidneys is insane. Just like, I mean, it, it, it destroys their kidneys on, you know, to a dog too. That's why kidney issues are at like epidemic highs in dogs because of the dog food industry. And more importantly, because the dog food industry itself is like it's over 80 like over 80 percent of the formulas are carb based dog foods for an animal that's not supposed to eat carbs you know what i mean it's like if you had a pet shark you wouldn't feed them like grass burgers mm -hmm. you know like you would feed them meat mm -hmm. you know so it's like to me the science is so obvious so now i look back on when i was one of those people and i'm like wow that was embarrassing you know, but at the same time, I get it. Because mm -hmm. like, I never did. I never, I've never heard of that. I never did that as a kid. Like, mm -hmm. I think with the raw food, it's like, there's only two options when you go, well, my pet store, I, it's like you, you get the patties um, and they're prepared. They're all good. Mm -hmm. The question with the meal prep, how does it work? Do you, they send you like a week of food for your dog and no 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 so just a meal plan like you prep and you you know chop it all up and freeze it like they're making the meal plan like you're just following you know like okay so this meal would but be you're buying the ingredients and you do it yeah you buy you do all the work but like Got you're it. following <laughs> the plan you're you're you know like six ounces of pork two ounces of this uh, uh you know yeah, so like it's just the plan, not the actual food itself. They do, there are services like that, but I've never seen one. If one that's awesome exists, please someone hit me up and let me know. But I've never seen one that I would ever feed to my dog. Like the best pre-made food I've come across so far is consistently answers. 
-hmm. like the brand answers. Okay. Um, consistently, they're like the highest rated pre-made raw food. I would take them over Chewy, uh, Stella and Chewy's. Uh, I would take them over, you know, Primal. Like for, for the pre-made stuff, Answers is pretty good. Okay, yeah, we've been using Primal. Um, but, okay. Answers is hard to find where I am. I don't know about where you are, but like I, everyone online is like, oh, I feed Answers everything. And like I just sit there and cry a little bit because like I've never seen it in a store in New York, like <laughs> ever. But outside of New York, everyone seems to have it. I don't I don't know, but it's it's really it's really good for you know for, yeah. for pre-made. I have to look into the meal prep. I I can't believe I'm thinking that everyone's getting their dogs uh, uh, pre-made meals. <laughs> no, no, you got to do that yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you got to put on an apron and get a cleaver and start <laughs> hacking stuff up. Yeah. Um, so, someone asked, do you have a ritual before going on the trial field or training bite work? Uh, so for myself, I just listen to music. I don't do anything like wild and crazy. Like I, um, I'm not like, uh, I don't, I get really anxious watching my friends on the field. Like I freak out, like watching anyone that I know, especially if I've been a part of that dog. So like Jonathan can tell you that I like, it's like, I get like a temporary disorder when like, like he steps on the field with Puma and I'm freaking out. But when I step on the field, I'm not freaking out. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, it doesn't mean I'm not I'm like super calm. I'm like I'm still tense and nervous. Like every like you, you're always gonna step out there with nerves. You're always gonna step out there with. But I'm not like I'm not like an anxious, nervous person. So like I, I just listen to music, and before we walk out there, I play with my dog. Mm -hmm. Like that's but that's what we do always. Like before doing anything, so like we I play with my dog. Um, throw a little bit of obedience in there and I just take the leash off and step on the field. Like it's, it's not like some wild and crazy routine. Um, that's just what works for me because it instantly gets them super engaged with me. Um, it used to be a little different because I used to like warm them up, play with them, do all of that. And then I, when I would like right before getting on the field, I'd, you know, like use his on switch a bunch of times, be like, ready, ready. And he starts barking and going crazy. And like, I don't do any of that anymore because he's just too, he's too much as it is. So like now I'm just working on keeping him as calm, as calm as possible on the trial field, which if you've seen him, calm is a relative word. Um, so he can be like completely controlled, but he'll be like barking and like raging but he's still focused the whole time. So now I'm just trying to keep him calm. So I took out all that like amping up and now like we just play and we go on the field. Mm -hmm. yeah. When did you realize it was like it too much the amping up? Well, he, I stopped doing that a, a, like a, before walking onto um, even into training a while ago um, because he's, he's a dog with a hair trigger, you know, like it, it, his it, his sensitivity for frustration is through the roof. You know, so he like he's a super clear headed dog, even when he's jacked up, even when he's for. That's why I love him because he's still like he's just like Puma when it comes to that like unstoppable laser focus. Like you could never talk to a decoy that has worked with Puma before and isn't blown away. The dog is is out of this world like she is on another level and her brain it's like the dog version of the terminator like she is clear-headed all the time that's manic he just sounds like a lunatic because now that he's maturing he's maturing into his father and his father was a very loud vocal dog that would like bark as he's healing and like so now Manic's like maturing into all that stuff. So like I, I actually stopped amping him up before he started maturing and getting worse. So that, now it's like, thank God I stopped that because it would just be getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Mm -hmm. You know, like I don't, it's, that dog doesn't need to be amped up. Mm -hmm. Like he could be in a coma. And if I just go ready, he's like ready to go to war. Like, so he doesn't need any more help with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Um, question on um, play when you're when you're playing with your dogs um, how do you get them to focus on you as the game 
um, rather than like them trying to possess a toy from you. So that's a really loaded question. There's a, like, there's a lot, I can't technically give you like the full answer because it would require like way more than just like a quick explanation. Um, because it's a whole system that makes that work. Like you can't just do this or that. It's not about the toy. It's not about, like there's a lot of tricks. There's a lot of little tricks, like keep a leash on them. It's like, I'll do things like I'll put like a 10 foot leash on me and I'll clip it to my belt and I'll run away from them, right? So like, if you get with that out of my bubble, like the little bu bubble of engagement, I'm gonna run away. And if I get to the end of that leash before you see, you're gonna feel that like, you know, that like tug or pod and swing around, you run back to me. So there's, there's ways to teach them like always come back, always come back, always. But they're all just little tips for a much larger system, you know? So like teaching the dog, like I posted a video and, uh, I posted a video a while ago of Manic and I, I had like a handler vest on. So I just took out a random toy and instantly started playing, right? So as we're playing, I took, say it was a tug. I don't remember what the toys were, but say it was a, a tug. I pulled out a Frisbee. Yes, he let go, started playing with that. Pulled out a ball on a string. Yes, let go, started playing with that. Pulled out something else. Yes, let go, started playing with that. He didn't drop it, pick up the ones off the ground. He was just like, let's do this. I just want to play with you. With but it's not as simple as just do. There's so much that went into like teaching him that it doesn't matter what's on the ground. Teaching a dog that there's no, thank you. So I just saw that comment. Um, teaching a dog that like, it's all about you. There's so much that goes into it, but I think your whole relationship has to be geared towards something like that. Like for the dog to be like, I don't care about the toy, I want to play with you. You know, like for, for a kid to be like, I don't care what game we play, dad. I just want to play with you. Like that's got to be an incredible like relationship you have with your kid for them to think that. You know what I mean? Or, well, maybe you neglected them so they're just desperate. But like, <laughs> you know, like you, like you have to have the right relationship. It's not just about, like it's never about the toy, ever. Because if I pick this up and went, man, it's ready, he'll work for it. He'll work for anything. It's, it's, it's just the way I trained him. And there are little tips that do matter, like use a leash, always get the dog to come back. Um, or constantly change your reward when you use toys. Constantly change what you're using. So I think people fall victim to like, I would never use this, but like, this is my dog's favorite ball. So we use it every day in every session. And that's a really normal thing. Like, uh, oh, my star mark ball, like that's my go-to. That's part of the problem. Like Carmel would never let go of a baseball to play with a Frisbee. Like she'd literally just walk away from you, like, like disgusted that you would even think I would play with this insignificant toy. I have a baseball because I created bias by only using the same thing over and over again. So with Manic and Zero, and Zero, Manic is way more like this than Zero, because like Manic, I can literally take anything. So I can be like, take this clicker and be like, do you want to work? And he will. Like, he doesn't care what it is. He's just like, I just want to do this with you, man. Like, but that's our relationship. But little things like, you know, you, all right, I'm going to start my session. What do I want to use? Okay, I haven't used that tug in weeks. Switch it up. Don't use it. It's also boring as hell for the dog and for you. Like, my dog does benefit from the fact that my attention span is horrible. So, like, they benefit from the fact that, like, I get bored doing the same thing. So, like, I go in my van and I'm like, what tug do I want to use now? You know? And, like, or I go in the training rooms, like, what toy do I want to eat? What food? What, do, what game? But even then, you got to keep everything you do changing, not just the rewards. You got to keep the training changing, what you do changing. If you do, if you train the same stuff every day, if I was your dog, I'd jump right out that window. Like, I don't want to work on focused healing every day. So, you know what I mean? Like, imagine if, if all through high school, all you did was go to algebra. That's the, like, that's a lot of dogs. Like, it, it's, I'm not saying most. But a lot of dogs live like that. Like they go to algebra 
every day, four times a day. They're in the living room healing every day, four times a day. And it's like, like the, the, that dog's bored. It's unfulfilled. And you'll see it. You'll see the dog plateau. They don't work that hard for this reward anymore. They don't work that hard for that reward anymore. Like, you got to keep it changing. Like, with, like with me prepping Manic all the way to a PDC, I only worked. I, I'm not joking. I have his training schedule. I've given it to tons of clients. I only worked on formal obedience with him twice a week. So we only did focused healing twice a week. Like, the whole time. So like I'd go to club and like I wouldn't even work on healing that day. Like, ah, oh, we worked on healing yesterday. I'm gonna go work on some retrieves or I'm gonna go play play a two toy game with sleeves on the ground. And like you gotta change it constantly. Mm-hmm. So the dog is constantly fulfilled because now it's not about doing the same thing with with the same thing. It's about doing something with you. Mm-hmm. You know, like your dog should be engaged no matter what you're gonna pay him with. But you can't, realistically, you can't take any dog right now and just make that happen. Like, I can't make karma like that. Mm -hmm. Not at 10 years old. You know, she's like, she's never going to be like that now. And I understand that. Mm -hmm. But I don't care because she's 10. (laughs) Okay, that was for Oakley. I hope that was helpful. Okay, David, we're like already at an hour. Do you have time for a few more questions? Sure. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um... Can we talk about muzzle training? What are the sure. benefits of mu- muzzle training and why do people muzzle train? Um, I think sadly, most people muzzle train. I, I think most training tends to be reactive, right? Like now that your dog is doing this, here's what you're gonna do to fix it. You react to what the dog is doing. So now that the dog bit the vet tech, we gotta put a muzzle on. So they go to the vet, you slap a muzzle on the dog. They're like, what the hell is on my face? I can't move. And at the vet, they usually use like the alligator thing where it's just like clamps their mouth shut. So they can't really breathe properly and they start freaking out. And like, so like stress and frustration go through the roof. They're... Now, if they were trained to be comfortable with this, the dog would have been fine. They might have been trying to lick your face with the muzzle on. Like, it it didn't have to be a traumatic experience, you know? Like, so if you train the dog to to be comfortable with the muzzle on, then when you do need it, because your super friendly dog that's never even shown their teeth to any living creature in the world, broke a nail off and has to go to the vet. And they're in so much pain that now they're kind of blinded by it. So now they're snapping and it's not really their fault. They're injured. It's understandable. Now what do you do? Slap a muzzle on, you know, like, well, well, now, yeah, slap a muzzle on. I muzzle trained my dog years ago. They're fine. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so now you put a muzzle on, the dog's fine. They're not getting worse. They're not getting more stressed out. They're not, like, you, I think every dog should be muzzle trained. Every dog should be comfortable in a muzzle. You should be able to, like, take your dog for a walk in a muzzle, mm-hmm. right? Like, I do. And I know that my neighbors look at my tiny little dog with his ridiculous, like, leather muzzle on, like, oh, man, what an aggressive dog. But Manic's embarrassingly sweet. Like, he's pathetic. He'll just roll over. Like, he's, it's ridiculous. Like, you'd never think this dog could do protection work. But they see this little rat walking around with a big leather muzzle on. And, like, you know I'm getting judged. My dog is getting judged. Who cares? It's not for them. It's not for me. It's for the dog right like it's for training it's for just to get it and you know conditioned and used to it but i also look at it like it's another thing to train right training is training why not teach them one more new thing Mm -hmm. that's why like i don't manic doesn't know manic and zero i don't i'd have to look it up because i have it written down because i have to track them all but they each know around give or take a few they each know around about 40 commands each like probably every one of my dogs probably knows about 40 different commands they're just different from one another. Like Karma knows stuff that they, the others don't know, but they don't know any tricks. Karma does. Karma knows how to like roll over and wave and like stupid stuff. And uh, but like Manic and Zero don't know any tricks. So people hear that and they think I'm against it. I love trick training. I just don't do it. Mm-hmm. I love trick training because you're teaching your dog something else. As long as it's not paw. This. Mm-hmm. 
Like, give me your pony. Because it turns into the most compulsive, annoying, and every dog just goes like this. Like, you go to hand them treats, they knock it out of your hand. You go to put them in a collar, they're scratching you. You go to, so like, I would never teach a dog the most basic trick of all time, but like, roll over, like all those other things. It's still training, it's still benefiting them, it's still teaching them something new. It's still fun. It's still, you know, like, it's still training. And then, like, muzzle training is the same thing, but at the same time, if shit, hits the metaphorical fan like your dog's going to be in a much better position now yeah definitely like i look at it as a preventative like just be proactive mm -hmm. and if your dog's aggressive then obvious you have very obvious reasons to muzzle train your dog mm -hmm. right, like, i think i mean that's the beauty of having well i mean having a malinois like you have to train and you have to you know put time in and i think mm -hmm. a lot of people like myself with a small attention span you always want to keep it interesting mm -hmm. and like for me like now that's another thing to add to my list of things that i would like to do with my dog you know yeah yeah you know, the, the muzzle the i mean we have been doing a lot of tricks eventually i do want to do a sport with her mm -hmm. um, but yeah the muzzle training yeah like i'd like to throw a random trick title on some of my every <laughs> one of my dogs could do it I have like I have checklists somewhere in this room of like some of the trick titles that you need because why not? It's just something else to do with your dog. Mm -hmm. It gives you another excuse to have productive time with your dog, teaching them something, fulfilling their needs. Like whether you do dock diving or like you, you know, you know, like, like you do nose work or barn run or whatever, like do something with your dog. That's why we have them. They can't rot in a crate or rot in a place command, or rot in the backyard, or on your couch all day. Like, they can't just sit around and do nothing. Like, but the time we spend with them, well, what are you doing? Because a lot of people look at the time, they're like, oh, well, you know, my dog was in my office all day. Like, my dog was actually in the office all day with me. That wasn't bonding for us. That didn't do anything for us. Like, me reaching down and petting her didn't like build up a better relationship. She's just being a lazy bum. Like that's not productive, but if all oh, that was like a hike in the woods, it's a very different time now, you know, like the, 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 that's why I always say like, play with your dog because you know, like it's the most important thing in the world. Like spend productive time with your dog. Like going back to the whole like um, s psychology of, um, dog training and just the behaviors like I noticed the biggest difference like moving from LA to New York is activity level like in LA the weather's always nice you know you can always go outside you're always mm -hmm. active that's just how it is New York it's a little it's more work to um, get outside more work in the sense of like it's easier to just stay you know it's COVID stay yeah. inside um, work from home you know at your computer you know maybe go watch TV uh like and then you know it's it's dead time or whatever um I, I feel like uh here like having that time to go and work out with Rika has is so much better for me psychologically like to have that release and mm -hmm. to to move around like i function better like in every yeah. part of my life, she functions better in every part of her life. Yeah. Our relationship is better because we do things together. Like mm -hmm. exercise, time outside, like it, it, working out your brain can only benefit you, yeah. can only benefit your dog and can only benefit your relationship. Sometimes like the smallest, what seems like the smallest, shortest interaction with your dog to you is like one of the most beneficial for both of you. So, like, I could play with one of my dogs for literally two minutes and put him right back in the crate. And that dog goes back in the crate going, well, I have no idea how much time that just passed because I have no concept of it, but that was the greatest experience of my entire life. Now I'm going to sleep. And they go to sleep. <laughs> and then the door opens and they're like, I don't know what day it is or how much time has passed, but it's time to live life to the fullest and, like, we go play. And like, it could be the shortest experience of their life, but they live in the moment. And because it was fun, it was the greatest experience of their life. 
you know, so they walk away from that. Like that was the, the best play session I've ever had. Meanwhile, you've, you've had better, you know, like it's, that was the best ball I've ever played with, but you use it every day. It's the best food I've ever had. You, they, they eat it every day. They live in the moment. So when you play with your dog, if you do it productively, if you do it well, that's the best game they've ever played in their entire life. And then they go to sleep. And like, like when you go to sleep, it's like someone went and just pressed pause. Your whole life stops. That's why when you fall asleep on the couch, watching The Office, you wake up like your house might be on fire because it might be Saturday. I don't know how much time has passed. And like everyone jumps up and they're like, oh, it's only an hour, you know, like, cause you don't know, like your, your dog's no different. They go to sleep and time stops, you know? So like, what, what are you doing when time starts again? That's why I said like, like the, the days of me just like laying around with my dogs all day, it doesn't really happen anymore because I have so much more fun doing so much more with them. But I also just see so much better behaviors out of them. Mm. Like I did that. I did that with karma. She turned into a monster, you know, like now she lays around all day. We don't need to lay around together anymore. Like sometimes I'm coming down there and I'm going to harass the hell out of you and then we'll leave you alone out of nowhere again. But otherwise, like I, I want my time to be good. Mm -hmm. positive then I want them to be like that was awesome you know like you go outside and play frisbee there's nothing in the world happening to that dog besides you and that game you know like that's productive um, someone asked um, what are your thoughts on service dogs um, doing protection work of course um, <laughs> So I'm I'm just gonna be honest. This is a question that is almost always asked to like to trigger things. So I'm not gonna go down that rabbit hole because it is a very controversial subject. But I think it can be done. It can be pulled off. I don't think it's a good idea for most people. But I don't think service dogs are a good idea for most people. Or bite work is a good idea for most people, right? So like what I'm saying is not offensive. I just don't think it's a very good combination for most people. I also think that it depends on the service your dog does and the bite work your dog does. So I have seen a bunch of service dogs that are legit service dogs and these people depend on them. And I'm not gonna say who they are because that, that'd be ridiculous, but they are very competitive in, in, in IGP, very competitive dogs and they're really, really effective service dogs. But those dogs in their training with their decoys and helpers and training directors, they know we never do civil work with these dogs. We don't train them to just, you know, like they're not doing these things that like if the handler passes out in aisle seven at the grocery store with their service dog and now someone goes running over to help, they don't get lit up and go to the no. hospital. Because that's where people get in trouble is that like, if you train the dog, the behaviors like that, like handler attacks, like what happens when you, you, you have a seizure or you fall asleep or you, you know, whatever. And someone goes to help you and your dog attacks them because you taught them to. That's where I think it can go wrong. But you can then look at that and like, well, that's a matter of training. That's bad. Tra not necessarily. Not if the picture looks the same to the dog. Someone running at your, you know, human like this, and you're trained that when someone runs at them yelling and screaming, you attack them. And I'm saying this because I've seen it. I've seen like it, it happens. It happens in real life. Like I've, I've had people tell me this that like, yeah, my last dog, you know, like something happened at Applebee's and they attacked the waiter when the waiter was trying to help me because. And like, I think that's where it can go wrong, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. I've seen it done and done well. So I'm not like against it. Like there's people who think that I'm really against that. And I don't know why I'm not against that. I'm against you doing it with the wrong dog. Right. But then again, I'm against you having a service dog with the wrong dog. I'm against the dog that's in, you know, under your table at Chili's. That's actually very food possessive. So when the waiter goes to pick up something on the floor and the dog, the dog nails them thinking it's uh, trying to take their French fry, like, or the dog's nervous or, you know, fearful or aggressive, like I'm against anyone doing the wrong thing that's, you know, wrong for the dog. 
So to me, this is no different. Mm -hmm. You have to have a very special combination, I think, to truly pull that off in a beautiful way. And again, I have seen that done. That doesn't mean it should be done, but you can absolutely pull it off. Good answer. Um, what do you think is the biggest challenge um, with more than one dog? Uh, time management. But I mean, it's not like we don't really, I want to say we don't struggle with it, but I guess it's, um, we're also just used to it. Like this is my normal life. So it's like, this is how it, how it is. Um, like if I added another dog, it, it would change things, but it wouldn't be like the world's craziest change because pretty good at juggling all these dogs. Um, but it's how well you manage your time, right? Like how productive is your time now? Because if you add another dog, you better be really damn good with your time because every dog just added exponential amounts of work to your plate. And if it didn't, you shouldn't have that dog, right? Like, if if you getting another dog, like, uh, yeah, it's not, it should be harder. Like, it would be harder for me. I'm just used to it, mm -hmm. right? Well, but, like, time management is everything. Being able to portion out enough time for training and feeding and exercise every day, that, I think, is the challenge most people face. Mm -hmm. One person's having an issue. She has two dogs, and um, she's – struggling like training one dog while the other one is you know just in the crate or down or in place well should i would just put the dog in a crate so it's sleeping now unless you're doing working on like neutrality or something and you're like really trying to calm the dog down or something like putting the dog in place commands constantly is not really the greatest thing for the dog it's just like an extremely like boring drive killing kind of life um, but I can, all, some dogs will also like watch a dog being trained in front of them and get really stimulated by that. So it can also be like, almost like antagonistic with the wrong dog. Um, but if your dogs are crate trained, you just put your dog, put one dog away, take one out and train them, put them out, take another dog out, train them, put them out, take another dog. Or you can do what, what we'll do sometimes. We'll put like dogs in place commands. And then I'll take one and train them in front of the other ones, put them back, take one, train them in front of the other one, put them back, take one, train them in front, put them back, and then, like, cycle, you mm -hmm. know? But that's not for, like, hours. That's for just the training session. Mm -hmm. um, but as long as you – you, I think having multiple dogs if they're not crate trained is a living nightmare. Like, it's, you don't have to live, like, a kennel, like, like literally crate and rotate your whole life or anything. Like, I, we don't actually do that, but – I think if they're not crate trained, it, it adds a monumental level of difficulty to everything. Thank you for that. Um, the other ones are a more specific. Um, I don't know if we should go into that. I think, do you want to call it? <laughs> it's up to you. Um, if, if, if you have a few more, it's up to you. I don't know how in depth they are. Some questions are like, you know, mountains and some are, um, okay, this is a, a one from a trainer. Um, what are your general modules? How do you manage clients? Do you use any apps like Airtable? No. Okay. Um, so I, I don't, I don't do packages. Like I do things on a case by case basis with people. Um, <clears throat> so because of that, I don't have like like this crazy computer system to track everything. I do track everything, and I do like you know, like most of my own bookkeeping besides my accountant. And I, you know, I do track all my clients and how many I have. I have every eval form I've ever done in my entire career still in a filing cabinet. Like, um, but I don't need like some wild and crazy system to track everything. It's, it's all pretty easy for me at this point. Like I, I put my lessons into my calendar and schedule and it saves them forever. You know, like it's, yeah. So personally I don't have that, but um, if I were to switch to something where it's like people can just go online and like pick their day and time for a lesson, then I would have to switch everything and, and add something like that. But right now I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, um, PSA question. If you don't get your second leg of PSA title, do you have to go back having to bat pass both legs again? Oh, no, no. There's like a 15% success rate or pass rate in the level twos. They would never expect you to get two in a row. Um, like there, you know, you you could fail twenty times before getting a leg, 
you know so it doesn't it doesn't matter like once you have it you have it it's it's not like taken away or anything you you don't ever have to go back okay yeah uh, um how do I play with my 13 week old Mal without getting her overexcited and have it turn into fighting? Uh, that's too much of a question technically, because that, that's like, how do I train a mountain wall? Um, so that I can't technically answer, but like if you're playing, you're probably playing way too long. Like if you're playing and, and like, it, it starts to get to be too problematic. Like play sessions, gotta remember, are not supposed to be like 20 minutes long or something, right? Especially with a 13 week old, that's like a fetus. So like this thing, it, like you, you shouldn't really be playing that extensively anyway. Like if you're playing tug, you should be tugging this thing. Like it's a joke. You should be like, oh my God, you're so powerful. You know, like you shouldn't be like fighting to the death. And t like your, your, your play sessions with your, your puppy at this age should be really short, gentle. You know, like it, sh it should be very, very simple. Uh, don't expect that dog not to bite you, but I'm sure you know that if you bought a Malinois, you know, like stick to toys or they're going to stick you with their teeth. Okay. Yeah, okay. How, um, how do I prevent a dog becoming collar smart? Yeah, yeah, so that, that's also like a super loaded thing, but you like the short answer is, um, they they need to be desensitized to wearing it and why they're wearing it, right? Like, you can't just put it on and go for a walk. Put it on, go for a walk. Put it on, go for a walk. You put it on, we're obviously going for a walk. Let's go, you know? So you can't do stuff like that. But the way I really prevent being collar smart is you wear it off and on, off and on, off and on for absolutely no reason at all. It might not even be turned on. You might not have a leash on it. It might not be working. It might not be, you know, useful right now. Obviously, this is never like, you know, put like a leash and prong collar or something ridiculous on your dog and put them in a crate. And this is like super, you know, off and on, off and on, off and on. But you could put a collar on your dog that you want to desensitize them to and then walk them with something else. And I do that all the time. Like, I don't want them to, you know, think that this collar means blah, 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 blah. So I'm going to put that on and 45 minutes later, I'm going to walk them with a slip lead today and not even use that, but it's on. Right. So like, and it, like I, I do stuff like that constantly, but like my, um, like Manic's not collar smart at all. He has no idea like what the different collars do because he's worn so many different collars. It's ridiculous. And like, he's always kind of wearing different collars. So he doesn't have any reaction from having any type of collar put on or taken off. Like Manic, and I've said this to, to people before, like on the trial field, it's not like my dog is collar smart. Like people worry about collars being collar smart in sports because you take the collar off and discipline stops. So the dog's like, ha, 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 I can fuck around now. And like, and they do. And then you pay, you know, the dog goes and bites the decoy, runs all, you know, like, because they know you can't stop them. That's not Manic's issue. Manic's reward smart. You're not going to reward me. That wasn't an issue at all. Like I didn't have any issues like that at all, you know, in the last trial, but that's more his issue because the collars are relevant to him. Mm -hmm. But I also don't use the same collar religiously for every single thing I do. Mm -hmm. Like I don't live and die by an e-collar. Like that's not, yeah that that's why he doesn't think that you know so it doesn't mean anything i like that you brought up reward smart because i my brother will say that about rika like oh she's playing dumb right now you know like he'll yeah. tell her to do something and then she knows that like like why does yeah. she have to do it for yeah. him? i should say he was reward smart mm -hmm. Because when I paid the price for it, when he showed that he was reward smart, it was over a year ago. So, like, I guess I shouldn't say that anymore. Um, but because it, it wasn't an issue at all. But he he was it was a, an issue. Like he he realized like so I'm gonna keep doing this with no rewards. So motivation starts to dip, mm -hmm. and that you know and like it's understandable if you realize like you just keep working your ass off and like. They're not even going to keep paying me for this. I'm at work. I'm doing all this stuff. And they're not going to pay me. 
your motivation is going to plummet. Yeah. You know, so like that's, that's, and that did happen in the trial with him, but it, it happened once, you know, mm -hmm. but we worked on it a lot and now it's, it's not an issue and hopefully it stays not an issue, but with his little evil genius brain, <laughs> we shall see. <laughs> um, what advice do you have to um, people that are interested or want to get into PSA? Uh, don't i'm just kidding it's awesome. <laughs> uh everyone's like scared to, to to join because like oh it's scary it's scary it's you know what like everyone says when they start doing psa everyone's so friendly like everyone's so friendly and welcoming and like technically that's not actually true like the dog world can be vicious and like this there's no sport in the world that's exempt from that part of the you know the, the population but like honestly overall it's pretty damn welcoming. Like there's a lot of really good people here and there's, you know, there's, there's going to be drama and there's shitty people. And like, everybody knows like the Instagram cool kid group that like, you know, like when you first join, you want to be part of that and you realize it's toxic and then you stay away. Like if you, if you, if you choose your friends wisely, it'll it, it could be the greatest thing you've ever done in your life. Like there, it's not something to be like scared of and stay away. It's an incredible, incredible sport it'll like it'll help you grow with your dog as a handler as an owner as a trainer like it'll build like it'll build you up no matter what you do it'll help build you if you have the right dog for it but like don't be so like in it, it's weird people are like oh like i i don't want to like you know I, I wanted to come you know stop by a club training in, in the state that i live in because there's there's a club there but I, I was scared to ask ask they probably be like, yeah, come on down. Like, maybe not, maybe not. But like, so many people are just are are like really welcoming, and you know, it turns into like a giant family eventually. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested, hit up a local club and see if you can check out what they're doing. It doesn't mean you can join, right? It doesn't mean that just because you have a dog, you can join. You know, like may, you might show up and go, oh, this sucks. I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. or you might show up and be mind blown. You know, like, but check it out before you like go all in. Cause I know some people watch stuff online and they're like, all right, I'm going all in on this, but they've never seen, I don't mean PSA, like anything, anything in life, you, you know, you can do that. You can get like really in interested and then you try it and it's not that great. Check it out first. Cause it's a, <laughs> it's a serious commitment. You don't casually do PSA. Well, if you want to, when <laughs> if you if you want to like actually do anything yeah. like on the i don't i'm not like some insanely competitive person like i'm not i don't go there to be like number one i don't really give a shit about that like i go to compete against the sport i want to pass i want to complete it i want to do it i don't care if you beat me if i pass i don't care if your trophy is better than mine that literally means nothing like people ask me how come your trophies aren't up because some people think that's like kind of rude. Like you earned, like put those on display. You earned them, and then um, it's not why I did it. It like makes me weird, like like uncomfortable. Like it's just I don't. It's this weird issue I have, and I don't know what it is. But like I don't put them up because I didn't do it for a trophy. It's one of like it's fun. It's fun. Like it's you know like it's like we have the time of our sport. lives doing it. It was never about like I I had four points higher than she did. Who gives a shit? It's not paying your bills or keeping you warm at night, you know, like, like I go to compete against the sport and myself, right? Because generally, if it's not your, if your dog is genetically sound, you're the only thing that's going to stop them, right? Like, I'm like, if, if my dog never got a three, which the chance of getting that is you win the lottery a lot faster than getting a three in, in the sport. But if my dog never got a three, it's, it's on me. I mm -hmm. failed, not the dog. Mm -hmm. And like, I can only say that due to genetics, but like I failed him. If I don't take this dog to the top, I failed. And I, I like that, mm -hmm. that it's not easy. Like it's the, like, it's the hardest sport I've ever seen. In my opinion, it's the hardest sport I've ever seen. And that's what I'm drawn to mm -hmm. that. They make it so hard to pass. And I love that. I love that. There's a 15% success rate. In the, in the level twos and like a one percent in the threes like it's you know like it's nobody passes in the threes you're never gonna pass in the threes you're not supposed to pass in the three and i think that's awesome 
Because then when you do, like you worked for that, you earned that. And it's, you know, like, I don't, I don't, like, I just want to pull that off. I don't, I don't ever need a trophy if I ever do that. I don't even, I don't even care. I just want to be like, I did it. You know, like, I just want to feel it inside. I don't even, I don't even need to, like anyone to know it. I wouldn't care. Like, I just want to achieve something ridiculously impossible. The sport is designed to be ridiculously difficult. And I I love that. You're not supposed to be the best. You know, like it's designed for you to not dominate the sport. And that's amazing. Yes. And I want to end on that note. Because I think it's a, I think it's a yeah, special yeah. one. And it's, yeah. thank you so much, David. Yeah, no problem. Uh, um, I have learned a lot. And I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you more. And um, I hope to like actually meet you guys in person yeah, yeah. you guys are um close where in long island are you uh we're in suffolk county i'm actually um probably 20 minutes jonathan's probably about 20 minutes farther east than me okay. if you know where yeah 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 um remind me to talk i want to talk to you about variable training schedules okay like what i did with manic about like so you're constantly changing what you're doing on the like on the side remind me and i'll okay i'll break that down I, I will. I'll uh, yeah. I'll remind you about that, and then also the Dremel that's coming tomorrow. Oh yeah, <laughs> that too. Yeah. Uh, all all right. Have a good night, David. Yeah, you too. Hi to this Isabella and uh, to the to the pack. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Have a good night. <laughs> See you.